the narthex, but uh, if you didn't get this one, you got the wrong brochure for now. We need you to have this one. If you don't have this one, would you raise your hand? The deacons have them. Everybody seems to have one, right? All right. Thank you so much. Let's, let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, we give you praise for this opportunity to meet. Thank you, Lord, for Sahar and Maria for allowing them to, to be here with us at First Pres. And Lord Jesus, how we thank you for the hope that we have in the gospel. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you've done. We praise you that uh, you are our Passover. And so we praise you for all that you've done in securing our salvation through your perfect life and your death on the cross and, and Lord, your resurrection from the dead. So as we pray to you, we're grateful that you hear us. And we ask that you would be near to us this evening by the power of your Holy Spirit. Would you open our hearts and would you use Sahar as he shares with us about uh, Christ in the Passover. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to learn and to grow in your grace. We pray through Jesus, our Lord. Amen. This is Sahar Sadlowski. How's that? Yeah, not bad. Sahar Sadlovsky and his wife Maria, they are, um, they are from Israel and uh, have come a long way. Uh, obviously, they're on a tour now going through the states. They just uh, were in Arab, Arab, Alabama, Arab, Alabama. Is that right? Yeah. Anybody ever, anybody ever been to Arab, Alabama? Okay. Yeah. All right. There we go. All right. So, uh, again, um, we are delighted to have you here. You know, um, if you don't understand the Old Testament and its connection to the New Testament, this is a wonderful opportunity to learn. Um, the Passover is a, a festival that is celebrated every year by the Jews, and it uh, commemorates the deliverance of the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. And if you remember, those that were spared were spared because of what? The blood on the doorpost. And so, uh, the angel of death passed over those doors, those doors of believers. And so now we celebrate Christ Jesus as our Passover. And so Sahar is going to bring that to life for us tonight. And so would you give a warm first prayer's welcome to Sahar Sadlovsky. This worker? Good. I'm very excited to be here with you uh, tonight. Um, I want to say also that it's a bit weird for me to be in, uh, outside of Israel during uh, this season of war. And at the same time, I'm very encouraged to meet so many faithful Christians who show so, lo so much love and concern uh, for their uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, yeah, to me and to my family that joined me to the tour. I would like to tell you a little bit about myself briefly before we begin the presentation. So I grown up in a traditional Jewish home. In fact, <clears throat> my family is the fourth uh, generation in Israel. So technically, my family is older than the state of Israel. Um, around my house, there were about five to seven synagogues. So I was always engaged with different kind of Jewish people and hearing about God, etc. But nothing was really uh, appealing to me. And uh, for me, God was something very transcendental, just an idea very far that has nothing to do with reality. And so I didn't really care so much about religion. And instead, I follow other gods, gods of my own imaginations and my idols. And one of these idols were uh, soccer. That is, to my American friends, I mean, real football. <laughs> no insult. And basically throughout my life, this is what I, I was focused on, on playing soccer and with the hope of becoming a professional player. Later on, when I was, uh, uh, right before I was 20, a few Christians, Arabs, joined our football team. And even though I grew up in Tel Aviv, where you, there are quite a lot of Arabs as well, that was the first time when, when I was encountering, when I had conversations with Arabs on a personal level. And we became friends. In fact, we became 
best friends. They used to invite me to their homes and they showed so much love to me and that really warmed my heart. And I thought to myself, whoa, not every Arab is a terrorist and not every Jew is a saint. And even though they never spoke to me about Jesus, I wanted to know about their belief about, what, about Christianity. And as a Jew, as, especially as an Israeli, there is an incomprehensible ignorance about Christianity and about Jesus. We know nothing about him. Only some fragments that we have had in, in, at some point in the class in, in, in a high school. But I was embarrassed to ask them, and so I Googled it. I don't remember what uh, Christianity or the New Testament, and, and the New Testament in Hebrew appeared to me. And I had my own uh, misconception. I thought I'm going to read about Mrs. and Mr. Christ, about some journeys in the Vatican, and even Emmanuel, how to persecute Jewish people, because I knew that Christian persecuted Jews in the history. And then the Gospel of Matthew opened with all this list of Jewish names, and then it discussed about Jewish concepts such as repentance and the kingdom of heaven and, and Messiah, what that has to do in a Christian book. And not only that, all those stories happened to be in Israel where I was living, when I'm still living, and nobody ever told me about it. But what really made a change, it was when I encountered the person of Jesus Christ. The more I read his teaching, and especially his, his works in, in Holy Week, as we now approaching uh, it, 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 it did something in my heart, and the Lord uh, kindled kindle me and gave me the gift of faith. And I believe that this is the Messiah. In fact, this is our Messiah. And, uh, and I began to, to believe that Jesus is, is our Lord. And I embarked on a journey that led me to seek for a church. And I just randomly and very generally wrote a Protestant church in Tel Aviv, and there was only one church that conducted services in Hebrew and in English. And then I, I came to the church, and the congregation and the pastors embraced me, and we began um, a meet every week. Me and the pastor, he catechized me and prepared me for a baptism, and I began to come weekly to the services. And uh, the Lord worked so much in me through, just through the rhythm of the liturgy of every week, hearing the Word of God, and led me to repentance and faith, and I was baptized in the River Jordan, actually, in the 7th of April, 2015, which soon is going to be nine years. Thank you. Later on, I uh, developed a conviction that I would love to share this wonderful message of, of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ to, with my people that don't know anything about him. And so I joined Jews for Jesus, and uh, there I'm working uh, until now. In addition to that, in, my, in that church where I met Jesus in baptism, I also met my beautiful wife, Maria, who joined me for the tour, and our two girls, who may, you may have noticed them running around and downstairs. <laughs> yes. And so, yeah, that's a little bit about me. And tonight... I would like to share with you a presentation which is called Christ in the Passover. Now, if you were to ask some Jewish boy or girl who the hero of Passover is, after giving credit to God, they will certainly tell you Moses. And that's true. But you see, it's not the whole truth. If you were to ask some Jewish boy or girl who knows the Messiah that same question, then they might tell you Jesus. And perhaps you're wondering, wait a minute, Sahar, what Jesus has to do with the Passover? Passover is Jewish. Well, and so was Jesus. And not only did he celebrate the Passover every week, every year, while he dwelt among us on the earth, but I think that he's clearly pictured in all of the symbol of Passover and in the story of Passover itself. For the message of Passover is the message of redemption. And the story of Passover is the story of our liberation from bondage. And this evening, as I explain this traditional Passover seder, it is really my hope that you will view it as I view it, not just as a nice entertainment time about Jewish, ancient Jewish tradition, but as an object lesson, Christ-centered lesson about 
the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Passover Lamb. I would like to read from the 22nd chapter of Luke. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. They went and found just as he said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. This is the word of the Lord. So Passover begins with the lighting of the candle, which is usually the duty and honor of the women of the house. And I would like to invite Maria to come and kindle the light for us. Thank you. After lighting the candle, she recites a traditional Hebrew prayer, which you should find in your brochure. So I will say it in Hebrew, and then I ask the women to read the prayer in English with me, all right? Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kideshanu bemitzvotav vetzivanu leadlik ner shel yom tov. Women, please read with me. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctify us by his commandment and command us to kindle the festival lights. Now, Jewish Christians who believe in Jesus might add a, tr- uh, uh, a Christian prayer in addition to the traditional one, and it goes like this. Baruch ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifieth through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. And I think it's fitting that the women get to kindle this light. Do you know why? For it can remind us that the Messiah, the light of the world, would not come from the seed of man, but from the seed of the women and by the will of God, just as the prophet Isaiah foretold. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear her son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us, a light to light the Gentiles, and glory of thy people Israel. And so Passover is not just a meal. It's a banquet. And it's not just a service, it's a ceremony. And while a meal or a service may take just one or two hours, the Passover Seder may take a total of four hours. And during this time, each adult will drink from his cup and refill it four times. The first cup, called the Kiddush cup, or the cup of sanctification. Then comes the cup of plagues. Then the third cup, the cup of redemption, which is the focal point of the entire service. Keep that in mind. Then we come to the fourth cup, the cup of Hallel, or the cup of praise. It is with the first cup, the cup of sanctification, that the host offer a blessing for all the rest of the evening to follow. Holding the Kiddush cup aloft, he recites a blessing. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, peri Amen. Gentlemen, please read with me. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth fruit from the vine. Amen. The service has begun, and the youngest person present comes forward to ask the meaning of Passover. He or she Ask the traditional four questions which are found in the Agada, which means the telling, and in your brochure. They are chanted, and the first one goes like this. 
מה נשתנה הלילה הזה מכל הלילות, מכל הלילות, הלילה הזה, הלילה הזה, כולו מצות, הלילה הזה, הלילה הזה, כולו מצות. Please read with me, everyone. Why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat leavened or unleavened bread. Why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread? Let me answer the first part of the question. Why is this night different? And those of us who know the story of Passover are obligated to respond. This is because of what the Lord did for me. When he brought me out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, when he redeemed me with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm. Redemption is the very heart of Passover. And yet, Passover imparts more than God's message of redemption. It imparts God's means of redemption through a sacrifice of a Passover lamb. You see, my ancestors were instructed to take a spotless lamb to roast it all without breaking any of its bone and apply its blood to the doorpost of their homes, to the top of the doorpost, and then to the two side posts. And so when the ten plagues fall on the, on the people of Egypt, we were spared from that ravages. For when the Lord saw the blood on our doors, death was forced to Passover. And that's where we get the name Passover. And in Hebrew, it's called Pesach, the holiday which commemorates the time when death passed over the houses of Israel. And why? Because they were worthy? Because they were better than the Egyptian? Absolutely not. But because of the blood of the lambs, the Passover lamb. What a mighty act, not a mighty act of redemption. But what a picture that foreshadowed an even greater redemption through the sacrifice of another Passover lamb, our Lord Jesus Christ. For just as none of the bones of those first Passover lamb were broken, we read that none of Jesus' bones were broken in his death. And just as my ancestors had to apply in faith the blood of the lamb to the doorposts of their homes, so the Holy Spirit calls us to put our faith in Christ, who has washed us with his blood, and marked us as his own through the sacrament of holy baptism. Now to the second part of the question. Why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread? We explain. Our ancestor, in their haste to leave Egypt, had to take their bread with them while it was still flat. Now one of the items found on the Passover table is this one. It's called a matzotosh. And inside of it are three layers of, I'm not sure if everyone can see, inside of it are three layers of unleavened bread, matzo. Each one is separated from the other by some cloth. Now the head of the house removed the middle layer of matzah and recites a blessing. Baruch ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Please read with me. Blessed are thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Then he breaks it in two. I'll try my best. <laughs> Cut it in the... He sets one half aside, and he gives the other half a special name. The Afikomen. Try saying that with me, all right? Afikomen. And that's not a Hebrew word, by the way. It's a Greek word, 
and some suggest that it may mean uh, that which comes later. I'm not sure if that's the, translate, that, that's the meaning of the word, but I know that that's precisely what happens. The afikoman isn't eaten yet. It comes later. For now, it's wrapped in a beautiful white cloth, like that, and it's hidden from view, buried. No one else at the table know where the afikoman is hidden, but later on, all the children would look for the afikoman and have to find it, or else the service cannot be concluded. And remember, it's four hours already. <laughs> the child asked two more questions. Please read with me. On all other nights, we eat vegetable and herbs of all kinds. Why on this night do we eat only bitter herbs? On all other nights, we are not required to dip the herbs once. Why on this night do we dip them twice? Let me explain by showing you this. This is a cedar plate. And despite its appearance, it is not used for devil eggs. <laughs> as, you, as you can see from the pictures on your brochure, a symbolic piece of food from the Passover cedar is placed into each one of these compartments. And all of these symbols are part of the pictures of redemption. The first item on the Passover plate, on the cedar plate, is this one. It's called karpas, or greens. And these greens represent life. But before we eat them, we dip them into salt water, which represent the tears of life. So by dipping, we are reminded that a life without redemption is a life immersed in tears. The next item on the cedar plate The next item on the cedar plate is called the chazeret. We generally use an onion or horse radish roots. And this symbol reminds us that the root of life is bitter, as it certainly was for our ancestors in Egypt. And then we come to the maror, the bitter herb itself, freshly grounded horseradish. <laughs> now I have to tell you something. It is customary for us to eat a full teaspoon of horseradish on Passover. Any volunteer? <laughs> you? Ah. You seem like the kind of guy who does what needs to be done when the chips are down, but... But like the, like the chazeret and the karpas, the maror brings to our mind how bitter life is without redemption. But by way of contrast, we have the charoset. And these represent the mortar that our ancestors, the Hebrew people, may used when they had to make bricks for Pharaoh. It's made up of chopped apples, raisin, honey, and nuts. And trust me, it tastes delicious. Now you may be wondering, wait a minute, why such a sweet mixture is used to represent such a bitter toil? And so the rabbi will tell you, this is because even the more, most bitter labor is sweetened with the promise of redemption. And what we find is that, do you remember that bitter taste that is left in your mouth from the horseradish, it's all gone and overwhelmed by the sweetness of the charoset. And that's precisely what happened with salvation. All the bitterness of slavery, of sin and failure, is overwhelmed and forgotten by the sweetness and comfort of liberty. When God says, I'm making all things new, he means it. This is not an Easter egg. This is called the Chagiga, which was the name given to the special temple sacrifice in Jerusalem. And we roast the egg just as the sacrifices were roasted, and that turns it brown. And the Chagiga is a token of grief to our people, grief over the destruction of the second temple. And during the seder, it is broken open, sliced, given out to each person at the table, and then dipped in salt water. But the, and the Chagiga is not only a token of grief, 
because it's also a symbol of a new life. The last item on the center plate, it's called a zoa, the shank bone of the lamb. Now, Passover is sometimes known as the feast of the Passover lamb. But you know that in most Jewish homes today, on Passover, lamb is not served. You see, the lamb that used to be eaten were the Passover sacrifices. But in 70 AD, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. And so was the altar where the sacrifices were performed. And from that time to this day, no sacrifices have been made. And so no lamb is served at Passover. Instead, this zoa, like the egg, the Chagiga, reminds us of sacrifices which are no longer offered. Now, the presence of these two elements, the egg and the shank bone, raises an interesting question. With no temple, no altar, and no sacrifice, how is it possible to atone for our sins? For the law of Moses states very clearly, I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by the reason of life that makes atonement. Leviticus 17.11. But some people today, both Jews and Gentiles in Israel and the United States, particularly in the Western world, they would tell you, well, perhaps that was important 2,000 years ago. It doesn't have any bearing on our lives today, doesn't it? But does it? If not, then why does the Agadah, as the law of Moses as well, instruct us to take the story of Passover personally? as though each one of us were being brought out of Egypt. And I think we're supposed to take the story of redemption, the story of Passover, personally. It's because each one of us needs to be redeemed. Jesus says anyone who commits sin is enslaved to sin. And the people of Israel, even when they were liberated from the land of Egypt, as they arrived in the desert, they realized, they discovered that within their heart, slavery still lives and bubbles. And that is slavery to sin. And in fact, the whole human race is colonized by sin and enslaved to it. But with no sacrifice, how is redemption even possible? With no Lamb of God. Once, nearly 2,000 years ago, there lived a Jewish man named Yohanan. You might know him better as John, John the baptizer, or the baptizer. And one day, while baptizing people in the River Jordan, his gaze fell upon the form of another Jewish man, his cousin, a man named Yeshua. And you know him better as? Jesus. And John looked at him and declared, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And that's how redemption coming to us, not through the blood of goats and lamb, but redemption through the blood of the Passover lamb, the Lamb of God, the Messiah Jesus, our Lord. The child asked a fourth question. Please read with me. On all other nights, our ancestors were instructed to eat that first Passover meal with their loins girded, with their sandals on their feet, with their staff in hand, ready to go at a moment's notice. But ever since, we relax and recline on pillows. We remind ourselves that we are free, that we are not in an area to anywhere. Perhaps that's why it takes four hours to celebrate the Passover. It's now time for the second cup, the cup of plagues. In Jewish tradition, a full cup of wine represents a complete joy. But in one sense, our joy is not complete. At this point in the service, we dip our fingers in the cup and let 10 drops fall onto our plates as we recite the 10 plagues that were poured out upon the Egyptians. We mourn for their loss. We express sorrows over their destruction. You see, there is an important lesson in this cup. Pharaoh defiled the will of God. He was repeatedly told what God wanted them to do, but his heart was hardened. And he said, no, I refuse. I will not. And as a result, he brought death and destruction 
not only upon his land, but into his home. His own son died because of his hardness of heart. And how often do we act in a similar, in a similar manner? How often do we know God's will for our life, but how often do we say no, I refuse, I want to follow my own heart? How often we act like the immediate moment and the visible world are what matters? That we are so dazzled by the things of this world and so heedless of Christ and the things that really matter. In fact, we too often acting like we are God's enemies. And in fact, the people of Israel whom God rescued in the Exodus were guilty of all of that too, as you read the story of, of, of the people of Israel in the Pentateuch. But God sent the plagues not to judge the people of Israel, but to save them. And you, who believe and are baptized into Jesus Christ, are like those Israelites, God's people. And his wrath, his tenth plagues, doesn't fall on you and your children, but on his firstborn son. By mercy you became, and you are, the beloved son that God redeemed with the life of his firstborn and beloved son. Now, after the second cup, it's usually the time for the food where all the aunts and the uncles and the, the, head, the people bringing their dishes to the, to the middle and begin to eat, just as we did before the meeting. Uh, but I would like to take uh, this natural break in the service to tell you briefly about the ministry of Jews for Jesus. So we may use the, the PowerPoint. So I would like to tell you a little bit about my work with Jews for Jesus in Israel. I'm not sure how much you're familiar with our ministry, but our mission statement says that we exist to relentlessly pursue God's plan for the salvation of the Jewish people because, as you can see, there is so much work to do. As less than 0.5% of the people of Israel believe in Jesus. That's a very small number. And that's why Jews for Jesus we partner with believers like you to send to the Jewish people messengers of redemption. And Jews for Jesus uh, reaches Jewish people with the gospel through three different types of ministry, and I would want you to remember them. And we call these our three pillars. And the first pillar of ministry is called Go and Tell. And here we bring the gospel to people who would probably otherwise not hear it. We will engage with people in public places like street college campuses, or backpacking trials. One of the ways I do it with my team in Tel Aviv is by meeting one-on-one -on -one with people who order New Testament copies from our library. You can move another slide. Um, you probably don't know that, but the New Testament is not available in Israeli bookstore. And so in Jews for Jesus, we want to make sure that we provide it to those searching for it. And in the past year, we reached nearly 2,000 book order of New Testament and other Christian literature. And before, particularly during the war, the number of order have doubled the average. And this is important to note because it highlights the existential crisis faced by many Israelis. And so they seek, they want to learn more, they want to hear more. They have a lot of questions that they earning to get some answers. They become so confused in our postmodern uh, ideas. And so we, we're meeting with them and we're sending them the New Testament and follow-ups with those, uh, um, those who want to, to keep learning and hearing more. In addition to that, we conduct online Bible studies for all our different contexts. We're taking them through different kind of series. Uh, recently we have had a series on the footstep of Jesus. We chose a specific event in the life of Jesus so that through the life of Jesus, people will be exposed to his story, and to his beauty, and to his wonderful message of repentance and faith. Every meeting, between 10 to 20 people attend, which is great, actually. Now, allow me to share with you uh, a recent encounter I had with a young Israeli 
man named uh, uh, Daniel. You can move another slide. He is a really brilliant uh, 18 years old boy. His, uh, his, story, uh, his story began during the, COVID lock, during the COVID lockdown where he began to explore uh, the New Testament teaching. And without even ever stepping a foot in a church, nor meeting a Christian, the Lord reveals himself to Daniel through reading the Word of God. So the Word of God was very productive uh, for him. And so he reached just for Jesus, but because he was a minor, we couldn't, we couldn't meet with them because Israeli law forbids us from sharing the gospel with minor without the consent of both parents. Once he came of age, he reconnected with us and I met him for a coffee. It was a heartening meeting where we both share our way to God or how he reached us and it was very encouraging. And we discussed what lies ahead of him now. Following the meeting, he gave me a call and telling me that his mom wants to meet me. <laughs> Apparently, his parents were very concerned that, he's, that something going really bad with them and uh, they invited me to their home and we began to talk. They asked all sorts of questions. What's the difference between Judaism and Christianity? Why he needs to be baptized? Is he still going to be a Jew Jewish? Where will he find a wife? <laughs> a concern of every Jewish mom. <laughs> and I tried to address uh, their concern, and she gave her a blessing. And currently, we're meeting uh, on a weekly basis. I'm taking him through a catechetical program in preparing him for uh, baptism and meet Jesus in, in baptism and initiate him into the church. So please, pray for Daniel, and pray for all the people with whom we meet. Your prayers and support enable us to be people of hope and be part of journeys like that of Daniel. Our second pillar of ministry is called come and see. Now, the first one was go and tell, and the second one is come and see. And this is an invitation for people to come and see what it means to be Jewish and believe in Jesus. And so we love hosting events where art, uh, music, films, and good food creates very good, very comfortable venues for gospel conversations and to build friendship with people, a genuine friendship. In our center in Tel Aviv, in the heart of Tel Aviv, we host all sorts of exhibitions where hundreds, even thousands of Israelis attend and we get to know each other. The third pillar of ministry is called love and serve. Whether it's reaching out to people who suffer from homelessness and addiction in one of the poorest cities in, in Israel, or building bridges, bridges to isolated communities like the ultra-Orthodox, we always try to serve people by meeting their needs. And adapting to the situation, we have established a very strong volunteering system of uh, packing uh, boxes of essential uh, uh, essentials item for soldiers and for refugees uh, who, who are now serving us on the front line. And in addition to that, we visit military bases, offering good coffees and companionship, especially for our brave soldiers who, who protect us. And so in our collective mourning, we try to bring light and hope into the darkness and the despair of our people. Indeed, with God's faithfulness, there is always reason for hope, isn't it? In times of fear, God speaks peace. In loneliness and discouragement, he reassures us that he will never leave nor forsake us. And since Jesus not only preached, but also fed and served people, he gave us that meaningful work after the likeness of his own. I would like to show you a short video but to give you a glimpse of, uh, about what's going on right now in Israel. So. The war affected our team. Uh, some of our staff live in cities that are bombed severely, so some of them even lost friends. And we all know either first hand or second hand people who have lost loved ones in those terror camps. And we're a part of the Jewish community, so we have felt the hatred. 
think the people of Israel feel uh, hopeless and fearful about the future and uh, they don't know what's ahead. So many in Israel are not only living in fear, but living without the hope of redemption in Messiah. Very few people believe in Jesus, maybe less than 1%. Most of the Israelis do not have access to New Testament uh, in their native language. Uh, more than 100,000 residents of Israel were evacuated from their homes. They needed care. The Lord calls me to visit and to comfort and bring food. There were weeks that we sent 5,000 packages of food to families throughout Israel. We have been producing animated you know, verses from the book of Psalms just to uplift in Israel. God is opening up people's hearts to the gospel right now in ways we have never seen before. We received over 600 requests for the New Testament in only three months. We have an opportunity to come alongside them and stand with them and love and support them in ways that are only possible when people think about the Bible. Jesus' message is one of love, hope, and healing in relevant for Israel is now more than ever. Just encourage your Jewish neighbors, they encourage your Jewish friends with prayer, visit. Would you pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Would you pray for the salvation of the Jewish people? Together we can love and serve the people of Israel. So all these things, however, is not something we can do unless you pray and partner with us. And there are various ways that you can become or continue to be our fellow workers in reaching the Jewish people with the gospel. In your brochure, you can see it, there is, there is a tear out portion that invites you to take the next step in reaching the Jewish people with the gospel. And by signing up to receive updates from me, where you will learn more about how God is at work among the Jewish people in Israel. And now you can pray, not just in general for the Jewish people, but actually concretely, on a regular basis to receive updates from me and prayer requests. And honestly, this, is, this means so much to me. There are not many Christians in Israel, and often loneliness uh, visits us. And to know that I have brothers and sisters, even across the globe, across the Atlantic, that hear my prayer request and pray for me, it means so much to me and strengthening my faith. So please go ahead and fill out that card, name, uh, name and address and email, and then drop it in the offering. Because without people like you who pray for us and stand with us, there will be no ministry in Israel. So please, uh, I would appreciate that. If you would like to fill uh, the information uh, online, you can scan the QR code with your, uh, with your uh, smartphone, and that would lead you directly to, the, to fill the information online. The second way that you can stand with us is by giving financially. If God is, giving, is leading you to give tonight, please indicate the amount in the involvement section down below where we can properly receipt. And thank you for your gift. And if you make a check, please make it to Jews for Jesus, not uh, to me. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's important. And the third way that you can stand with us is visit my literature table over there where I have, uh, that's my family. You got to see them in real life this time. In my table, I have some uh, literature available for sales and also, uh, uh, and also free material where you can uh, learn about the Jewish roots of the faith and how you can share the gospel in your own community. So please visit me there before you go. I haven't got it to speak and chat with all of you, so I would be glad uh, to help you there. So please don't forget to, to fill the involvement card, whether you're giving or not, so you can receive prayer requests uh, from me and updates from me from Israel. And so I would appreciate it tremendously. Pastor Penn, would you like to come up and pray for the ministry of Jews for Jesus? And then... I will return and conclude the pass over Seder. Everybody said, ooh. <laughs> Thank you, Sahar. It was six years ago that this church afforded Donna and, and me the opportunity to go to Israel 
And at that time, our tour guide told us that 1%, 1% of Israel were believers. And now it's one half of 1%. So uh, there's light in the darkness, and we need that light to shine. And I'm so grateful for Jews for Jesus. Um, as you said, I, I used to live um, a mile from a Jewish synagogue, and I watched how few people would attend. They all walked because it was Orthodox Jewish. And then there was their high holy day, kind of like our Easter. And there were cars everywhere. <laughs> and you, you go, oh, this is just like us. You know, so many nominal Jewish people, just like so many nominal Christians. So again, I'm grateful for your message, the message of the gospel that you're taking uh, in our country. And uh, we wish you the best in your trip home. And I'm grateful that you could bring your family along. Um, if you wonder why, this is the first time we've had a family come. There's a war going on. And it uh, was not something that Sahara was very comfortable with, leaving his family uh, during a war. Think about that for a moment as we pray. Gracious God, our Father, we're so grateful for Sahar and for Maria, for Thea and Adiel. We praise you, Lord, for allowing them to come and be a part of our church family on this night. Lord, we thank you for saving Sahar, for the, the gospel that called him out of darkness into the glorious light of Christ. And we praise you for his testimony and for the passion of his heart to share that good news with others. And Lord, it's a wonderful thing for us to partner with him as a church. And so I, I pray that you'll bless the offering we're about to receive and Lord, that you'll enable us to give, knowing that uh, you will use what is given for the building of your kingdom. Uh, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would the deacons please come forward now at this time and uh, receive the offering? And did they put the slips in the offering basket as well? Or not, Sahar? Put the slips in the offering basket as well, right? Yeah, okay. Perhaps after the presentation? That's correct. Well, I mean, those who the Jewish people who live outside of Israel, you should ask them that, not me. I'm living in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, briefly, I think that.
Let me. I know that one works. Let's do that. Is that okay? Um, yeah, I would need that. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. I think it works now, no? Test. Yeah, that one. That one okay, here we go. Let's swap. So I don't need to go up to Jerusalem. <laughs> So after dinner, we come to the third cup, the cup of redemption. And as I mentioned, this is the focal point of the entire service. But the service can't proceed just yet because something is missing. Can you hear me? OK. Earlier, something was broken, hidden, and now needs to be brought back. Does anyone remember what is it? I did. The matzah, but what's the Greek word? Good, afikomen, right, extra Australian for you. <laughs> All the children will search for the afikomen, but only one will find where it has been hidden. Once it is found, it is returned to the head of the house, and then it's broken again. Each person at the table receives a piece of it about the size of an olive. And this olive side piece is taken along with the third cup, the cup of redemption. Does this look familiar to you? Yep. It should, for this is the origin of our communion service. And not only that, consider this. Where else can we find a clearer picture of our Lord Jesus Christ than in this matzah, in this afikomen, which is broken, buried, and then brought back? Even the matzah itself, which is unleavened and in Jewish tradition a symbol, of, um, a symbol of, uh, of sinlessness, speaks of Jesus. The rabbis have set down very specific regulation concerning the preparation of the matzah if, it is to be, if it's to be found suitable for use. And one of these is that the matzah must be pierced. And now we know that Jesus was pierced. God speaking through the prophet Zechariah says, they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced. But I can see our Lord Jesus not only in the Afikomen, but also in the Matzotosh as well. Do you remember this strange pouch containing, containing three layers of matzah from which the Afikomen is drawn? So there is a bit of disagreement among the rabbis about the meaning of this strange pouch. Some teach that it represents the the three patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Others suggest that it represents uh, the three divisions of worship in the ancient kingdom, the priests, the Levites, and the people of Israel. But it all begs the question, wait, why does the middle matzah then is taken away, broken, buried, and then brought back? It doesn't make sense. So there is no agreement among, in the Jewish community about the meaning of this pouch. But there is another explanation that has its roots in ancient time, which I found the most compelling one. Now, there are three layers here, and yet they form a unity. And a Hebrew word, which may mean just such unity, is the word echad. And it brings to mind the word of Moses when he declared, Shema Israel Adonai Eloenu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. The Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, the word for one in that sentence is echad, a unity. And in the Passover evening, the head of the house removed the middle layer of matzah from this unity, from this echad. It is made visible while the other two remain hidden from view. Now, how much this alludes to the beautiful prologue of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14, and the Word 
became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. And in Holy Week, the Word was humiliated and broken, and the Word was buried. And on Easter morning, the Word brought back. You see that picture of incarnation, crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. And we Jewish Christians who believe in Jesus knows that the unity of the Matzotosh bear witness to the unity of the one true God revealed in three distinct persons, God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And why is the middle matzah broken, buried, and then brought back? It is because Jesus was broken, buried, and then brought back. This is my body, which is broken for you, he says. Eat it. We now come to the third cup. Now, the fruit of the vine is usually read at Passover, the rabbi said, to remind us of the precious blood of the lamb that was shed to redeem us from bondage and slavery to Pharaoh. And in the same way, the blood of another Passover lamb, of our Lord Jesus, was shed to redeem us from bondage and slavery to sin. And it was concerning this cup, the cup of redemption, the cup taken after dinner, that our Lord says, drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. We now come to the fourth cup, the cup of Hallel, or the cup of praise. Now, all of you know a Hebrew word, but I wonder if you ever thought that this is actually a Hebrew word. And that one is Alleluia, and it means praise the Lord. And it is, traditionally, it, is, it is tradition for us to recite Psalm 113 through 118, known as the Great Hallel. But this is also a time for us to reflect what Jesus had done during this time. He didn't drink a cup of joy and a cup of praise on the last night in which he was betrayed. He drank another cup, a cup of loneliness and many sorrows that we sinners have so willfully inflicted on him. He drank the cup of God's wrath that we deserve to drink. He drank the cup of God's wrath and emptied it down to the bottom. And by the shedding of his blood, fill it with grace for us to drink it as a cup of joy in the sacrament of Holy Communion. And so whenever you gather for the Lord's Supper, always remember that the only reason you get to share the cup of the Lord, it is because he drank the cup of wrath for you. And therefore, there is no condemnation left for you because Jesus paid the price for you and overflow your cups with joy. But there is one last cup which I haven't told you about. And this is a cup from which no one drink. This is a cup of Elijah. And in fact, in many Jewish homes at Passover, an entire place setting is left untouched, all for the prophet Elijah. And why? Why is this longing for Elijah the prophet? It is because the, the prophet Malachi says that before the Messiah comes, he will be preceded by Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Anavi. And so each year at Passover, a Jewish boy goes to the door, open it wide, hoping that the prophet will accept the invitation, enters the home, and announces the coming of the Messiah. And this sounds very pious and cute, but it's also very sad because we as Christians, those who have been enlightened by Christ, we know that he already came. And so he's the forerunner of the Messiah came in the person of John the Baptist. And I hope that this will 
call you to a loving identification with mission to the Jewish people, that you will join the father and the prodigal son who remain outside the house and plead with the older brother to come back home, to come to the party, to come because it's all his. Because Jesus, the fattened calf, was slain for us, for both Jews and Gentiles. He is our Passover lamb. We are living now in the reality, not in the shadow. Amen. Thank you, Sahar. Is, before you put that up, uh, is there anyone with a question that uh, you didn't get answered tonight that you feel like you want to ask about? I only hear it in America. Nobody speaks about it in Israel. So that's funny. <laughs> I, I, nobody, both seculars and even the Orthodox Jews, doesn't really speak or concerns themselves so much about reinstitute the, the temple or the sacrifices. Some... The sacrifices, they, they, they found the, the red heifer in Russia. Okay. And, and they're breeding it. Okay. Hmm. okay. All right. Someone else? Favorite parable? Oh, there are many. The last one I read, I will say. Yeah, people ask me, what's, the, what's your favorite book in the Bible? I'm always saying, the last one I read. <laughs> but, um, good answer. I think the, the Good Samaritan or the Prodigal Son. Mm. Anyone else? I think so, yes. I mean, uh, it, it becomes more uh, obvious the movement from what we say from, from shadow toward reality, from hidden toward revealed. And so for me, it was like God, like my father promised me one house, and then all of a sudden he delivered me the whole neighborhood. And that's what we receive in the New Testament, in Jesus. We, we, the promises are transformed into something greater than it was even imagined. And the book of Hebrew highlights that, that Jesus is better. We should not return to, to the shadow. My parents on both sides are Jewish. And we prayed for the face of Jerusalem before Jesus. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's, let's stand for our closing prayer. And I wish, uh, you, Sahar, you could go ahead and make your way over to um, the narthex area where your table is. And uh, that way people could find you and, and get to talk to you. And uh, I, I do uh, appreciate you and Maria being with us. Let's pray together. Father God, we, we do pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the salvation of your people, for the Jewish people, especially for those that, uh, Lord, are in this war-torn country in Israel. Uh, we pray for the hostages to be released. We pray for the families who are mourning, that you would comfort them as you promised to do. And Lord, uh, we thank you that you not long ago saved Sahar, and we thank you for that. We pray that um, you would give us the grace and the courage, Lord, to share the gospel with those that we know who do not know you. Um, we are thankful for your word that says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for the salvation of those who believe, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. So we pray, Lord. Uh, we pray for the many Jewish people who are ignorant of Jesus as the Messiah. 
God, would you use Jews for Jesus and even this congregation to reach those who do not know you and especially those who are Jews. Thank you, Father, for the peace of Jerusalem. Thank you for your work there and your work around the world. May it continue to grow. May the kingdom continue to increase as your gospel is shared. And we praise you that the gospel has come even to us. Through Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Good night. I know there's choir rehearsal, but thank you so much for your patience. have a quick choir practice with the children. It will take like 10 minutes.